equality? I mean, what does it mean that a small handful of people dominate the wealth and power of society? And I think that was very good and very important. Then the question becomes, a very big problem has been put on the table. How do we move to deal with it? And how does Occupy actually become something that can deal with what came down on it because it did that. Because by doing that, they brought the fire of the state down on them. They moved to crush the sisters and brothers in Occupy. And we actually thought it was very important that Occupy come back this year, even if it comes back in a slightly different form. Because if it got crushed, that would be a very bad thing if people did something that they couldn't sustain. It. But then you have to figure out how do you sustain how do you go against the power of the state? What does, you know, because there was talk among some people about, well, we got to organize in a distance from the state. Well, actually, you do not have the freedom to do that in this society. Because the state comes to you if you're doing something that's against its interest. So you have to figure out how you go up against the state. And then we have a difference around the thinking of the horizontalism is the way to go. Because we're in a society where large numbers of people are locked out of dealing in the realm of ideas. And if you say, well, everybody should just as horizontally go and do this, what would actually happen is that those who are used to dealing in the realm of ideas would have an advantage. We have to actually consciously figure out how we break that down, how we take that on. And we think that that requires those who see it, understand it, to work to create the social, economic, and political relations where people can be liberated from the shackles that the system brings down on people, and that does require leadership. Eighty-five percent of that I'm with. About eighty-five percent. That fifteen we were just talking about. But fifteen percent makes for engaging this. Right. 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 So let's but we want to open it up. Let's open it up. We've got forty-five minutes. I've been told that we absolutely have to stop. So, uh, let's start uh, with questions from the sides. I also have uh, some note cards with questions already. And so there are microphones on the side. And let's start over here to my right. Go ahead. Hello, hello. Oh, You're hello. actually streaming a stream. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Uh, hello, uh, Dr. West, uh, uh, Mr. Dix. My name is Richard. I'm a student of history. And um, it's crazy, huh? my question is in regards to strategy. In the decade or so after the death of Dr. King, I, in my studies, I've noticed that there's been a trend in civil rights and resistant politics. The whole infrastructure went from a politics of protest to an electoral politics. And right now, in this moment in history that we're in, I find uh, many of my comrades are critical and question the whole electoral process and question the worth of even voting. I have some comrades that know of some movements in the world, for example, in Africa, where they say, I have no land, I, I will not vote. Um, some people feel that there's too much money in public. So I would just like your input in terms of this, in terms of voting as a strategy and the worth of the electoral system now. Um, that's my question. Thank you. All right. Good question. All right. Good question. I will start off, and I'm going to try to keep it short so we can get a lot of this yeah. going. Mm -hmm. To me, the electoral process is where they draw people into choosing who's going to preside over the shit the system's going to do to them. And into legitimizing the limits that are put on the terms of discussion. You know, you, you can look at it, most of the folks in this country, by the polls at least, ain't with these wars that are being waged in Afghanistan, the threat of war with Iran. But it is an accepted premise among all of the real candidates that we're going to keep going in Afghanistan, and we might go try to kick off in Iran's ass. So when you go to vote, you're not going to get the chance to vote on whether this war is going to keep going on or whether they're going to make war on Iran. They're going to decide whether they need to do that. And you're only drawn in to ratify who presides over it. That is a no-win road. It is worse than useless. It's a trap because you get your energies off somewhere where you're ratifying what the system is going to do when you actually need to be putting your energies into building a movement to take on the system and ultimately to get rid of, rid of it, a movement for revolution. That's my mm -hmm. take on it. Yeah, just very brief because I, I, I disagree with my brother on that in this, this sense that uh, 
the backs against the wall, you have to use every possible terrain, every possible intellectual, spiritual, moral, political weapon mm -hmm. that you have. So if you withdraw from the left political system as corrupt as it is, then it invites right wing takeover. And when you have right wing takeover, it becomes even more difficult difficult to create the kind of movement that my dear brother Carl and I would want to create. So I just think you have to be jazz like. You gotta be improvisational, flexible, fluid. You got the inside and outside. You got the folk on the inside saying, you know what, get as much space as you can, we put the pressure on, but don't think that your electoral the elected officials constitute the only form of leadership in your community. I mean, our, our problem is the work of our leadership has been sucked in by just elected officials, you see. Or people on the outside, one thing they want to be is elected officials. Now we got president. That's about as high as you can go. What does it translate to on the ground in terms of good reality? Very little, because all the dark still running things. Now, if Harold Washington was president, he's no god, but he's Harold Washington. Mm -hmm. uh -oh. Technical difficulties. <laughs> he's got more problems. He's got more vision. Who they are, not somebody else. And Harold Washington would more than likely not be in the White House. Because he's too free a black man to be in there. But what, but what, what I'm saying is it's inside and out. We need both. We've got to be very discerning in your judgment. As to which electoral officials you do you keep them accountable. And you may have to have electoral officials who are open to pressure from the outside, the social movement, not just the lobbyists from the top. And so in that sense, I mean, like this, this recent election, I mean, it would be a catastrophe if Mitt Romney takes over life. It would be a catastrophe. It would be. The problem is, is that we got a disaster now with Barack Obama in terms of poor people. But disaster is better than <laughs> That's our choice. You got conservative version of oligarchic rule, and you got neoliberal version of oligarchic rule. Neither one can deliver for poor and working people, but there is still a difference. There's still a difference, it seems to me. And that's what we would have to represent. But I know we don't want to. All right, let's go to the next one on the other side. Welcome to Chicago, Dr. Webb. Oh, good to be here. Okay. It's very, it, it's an honor to meet you. So I really appreciate you coming here. And I feel honored to be in this room with you tonight. Thank you to Mr. Dix for being here as well. I appreciate having you here. And I'm glad that we're in a place where we can express our dissent because I feel that Mr. Dix said some really, really, really dangerous things tonight. Mm -hmm. And I think that when... I was with you about 85% until we get to what I call the Jehovah Witness piece. Where you get to a point where you say the only way is my way, and if you don't do it my way, then you're all wrong. And I think this Kevin, is very dangerous, and I think it's kind of killing the Occupy movement in the sense that everyone don't feel welcome. Prime example, I know a lot of people who would love to be in the room with you, Dr. West, tonight, but we're in high court. Kevin. And all of those people are left of Cottage Grove. And I think reaching out to the people that's left of Cottage Grove is imperative to build up this movement that contains more people like myself. I want to see more people like myself in the movement, but when you're shoving something down their throats, I think you're going to invite them to distance themselves from it. And that's going to destroy this movement. And for the record, Occupy haven't went anywhere. We've been active all winter, even if you haven't seen us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. Look, just briefly, I wasn't going to get up here and tell people go some way that I think is wrong. I'm going to tell you the way I think we need to go. I think I also said, though, you got to think about this. You got to dig into it. And even if you think the way that I'm trying to go is wrong, there might be some things that we need to do together. Now, if you agree with this, then let, you agree with that, then let's work together on this dangerous problem that I talked about. If you think it's not a dangerous problem, then you don't have to do it. I'm not shoving anything down people's throats. I'm saying the truth as I come to understand it through the decades that I've been out here struggling and working on it.
trying to give people the benefit of what I've learned through that, and then also, you know, trying to check stuff out. But that's how I know it's stuff. A single question on the right side. Hi, Mr. Dixon. Dr. West, so I'm going to have you here. Um, you do know very well that oppression is not going to avail us, but there are intersecting levels of oppression that work in various ways. And so I wanted to ask about one that I think gets short tripped, if it can get talked about. I want to ask about Cece McDonald, the black trans woman who, in self defense, killed one of her attackers and just accepted a plea bargain, bargain for three and a half years in jail that she absolutely doesn't deserve. Where do your visions for the future, the communist revolution or the revolutionary church stand in active resistance to the oppression of non-gender conforming peoples? Thank you. Okay, very important question because one thing that I have identified, at least in the New York situation, I haven't been able to look at it nationally, is that a very big target of both official repression coming from the state, but also right wing attacks, and a lot of them are racist because a lot of the trans women who I've heard of getting hit are black women who are being gone at. That's a very big rising thing that has to be dealt with, and it has to be dealt with in two ways. One is that it has to become a part of the movement against official repression. It shouldn't be that, well, there is resistance to official repression from normally gendered people, and then there has to be a separate movement for trans people. It's got to be part of the same movement. But we also have to recognize that there's a real targeting that goes on, both on the part of police officers, but also racist mobs or individuals who then get the sanction of the state for their attacks. And the transgender people become the criminals if they defend themselves. And I've seen that go down in northern Jersey. I've seen it go down in New York City where people talk about, you know, we are very open to all of this stuff, but somehow transgender people get set off a lot of stuff around that. So you posed a very important question, and it's one that needs to be talked about more because it is actually a rising thing. Transgender people get targeted by the cops, by racist mobs, and then the state condones and perpetrates their actions, and the transgender, transgender people get targeted for protecting themselves and defending themselves. Well, I think both of us would look, want to look for a way to the defense, both on humanist grounds in terms of human beings making choices, and not only making choices, but constituting cultures and subcultures in which their lives can flower and flourish as they determine it without engaging in injurious harm to others or having injurious harm being imposed upon them. And then, back to what I talked about in the Socratic imperative, the prejudice. You need to have some critical analysis. Where does the prejudice come from in terms of the criteria of so-called normal sexuality, these are these so-called non-normal sexuality that needs to be thoroughly interrogated and examined? And that's a very uh, adventurous and sometimes well, I can't say all that again. We're going to pause for a minute before it gets to 15 minutes, so it'll upload to YouTube.